Hello everybody, thank you for joining me for another story time. I know we just had a new story time last week, but there's something super special happening this week and it actually starts today. So our story is going to be related to that something special, which I'll talk about at the end of the video. But our story today is going to be about bears. And bears have been working super duper hard all summer long to eat all the food that they can find so they can put on a nice healthy layer of fat. So bears going into winter, in the fall going into the winter, have to have a lot of fat on their bodies. That fat helps keep them warm and it also provides energy for their bodies through the winter. Because who knows what a bear does during the winter? If you said hibernate, you are correct. So bears sleep all the way through winter. They're not getting up to find more food. So they have to have a really healthy fat layer going into winter to be able to survive. Now, when bears sleep during the winter, it's not just like when you or I sleep or we lay down for a nap. Their heart rates are gonna slow down. Their breathing is gonna slow down and their metabolism or how they kind of digest food and move nutrients around their body that's gonna slow down too. So they eat everything they need leading up to winter and then they can take a nice long snooze during the winter season. Now, here in Minnesota and Wisconsin, we have only one type of bear. Does anybody know what kind of bears we have? If you said black bears, you are correct. And our story today isn't going to be about black bears. It's going to be about brown bears or grizzly bears. And those are typically much more aggressive than our bears here in Minnesota. But we don't have to worry because we don't have grizzly bears here in Minnesota or Wisconsin. But grizzly bears might have different diets. They might eat different things. They might be a little more aggressive in their territories. But overall, their routines throughout the year are very similar to our black bears here. So we're going to read a story about kind of a year in the life of a bear and see what's going on. We'll talk more about this special event after our story. So our book today is called Honey Paw and Lightfoot. And it was written by Jonathan London and illustrated by John Van Zyl. This is the first page, Honey Paw and Lightfoot. They're in the snow. In the bushy willow bottomland, Honeypot ambled, stopped, sniffed. On a rock spine against sky stood Old Man of the Mountains. Honeypot watched as Old Man scrambled down the rock slide. The closer he came, the bigger he looked. This is Honeypot. She's looking up at old man. It was June, the mating moon of grizzlies, and that night, under the stars, the two great bears became a pair. Over the next days, they browsed together, tossed their great heads, and chased each other. But one morning, Honeypaw rambled on, hungry for berries, and old man went his own way, up in the mountains. All summer, Honeypaw read the wind and the mysteries of the rivers, seeking food. And in the fall, she ate to get fat for winter. Days grew short, nights grew long. Honeypaw sensed the snows rolling in. She dug a den on a slope away from the wind, made a bed of bear grass, moss, and bows of young fir. Finished just in time, for soon the big snow came. Then Honeypaw snuggled warm in her soft bed and snored in a sleep so deep, her heart beat so slow, you might think she'd sleep forever. Finally, in the heart of winter, Lightfoot was born. Helpless, almost hairless, blind, no bigger than a hamster, he nursed in the deep dark warmth of his mother's den. 
So female bears, while they're hibernating, if they were pregnant, will give birth while they're hibernating in their dens during the winter. Come spring, two moons later, Honey Paw and Lightfoot awoke. Lightfoot bumbled out, blinking into the sunshine, a furry ball of hunger. I bet you would be pretty hungry if you hungry if you hadn't eaten in a couple months. Come spring, two moons later, Honey Paw and Lightfoot awoke. Lightfoot bumbled out, blinking in the sunshine, a furry ball of hunger. He followed as his mother hunted and grazed and dug for roots, showing her cub good foods to eat. If Lightfoot strayed, Honey Paw swatted him back into line. But not all was the business of finding food. Mother and cub liked to play. Swoosh! Honey Paw and Lightfoot plunged down the slopes, skidding to a stop in a shower of slush. Again and again, swoosh! Sliding on belly, back, and rump, rolling head over tail. It's kind of like they're sledding, right? They're sliding down a hill. How many of you like to go sledding in winter? All through spring, Honey Paw and Lightfoot loped and ambled, eating bear grass, bear flowers, bear clover, and if they were lucky, honey. Mm. Every two or three hours, Lightfoot stopped to nurse. He nuzzled his mother and drank warm, rich milk. After eating, they would sleep the hot hours on a daybed dug in the soft earth. This is what my dog does in the summer when he gets too hot. He digs a nice hole down into the cool earth and he sleeps. <gasps> Then one day, toward the end of spring, a huge grizzly, big hairy one, lumbered down over Deadfall, the muscles of his great flanks rippling. It looks really big. With a sudden roar, big hairy one came galloping after Lightfoot, fast as a racehorse. Lightfoot scrambled away. He could feel hairy one's breath. Honeypaw lunged between them. Lightfoot slid beneath her legs, tumbled into the river, and was swept away. The last Lightfoot heard as he wailed and rolled down the current was his mother's roar rumbling off the cliffs. Do you think Lightfoot's going to be okay? Lightfoot tumbled and choked in the white water, hooked a snag, climbed up, and waited, shivering in the spray. As the dark stopped and the moon rose, Lightfoot yowled but did not let go. calling for his mom. When dawn spread across the sky, Lightfoot saw Honeypaw pick her way, bleeding and ragged, over the boulders. At last, Honeypaw reached up, above the roar of the waterfall, snatched her cub, and held him tight. Lightfoot was safe. So grizzlies are pretty territorial animals, and sometimes they might get in fights. The bigger male bears might go after a mom and her cubs, and she might have to fight off those bigger male bears. So it seems like she had to fight off that other bear, but now she found Lightfoot again. Honeypaw couldn't play with Lightfoot until her wounds had healed. A moon passed, and another moon. Then one day, Honeypaw bent a willow brush over for him, and when Lightfoot jumped on, Honeypaw let the bush spring up. She launched him into the air. She's ready to play again. And Lightfoot flipped into the river. Splash! Through another year of moons and seasons, Lightfoot grew, learning from Honeypaw where to feast on the juiciest roots and berries, dig the best den, and find the best places to play. Soon, Lightfoot would be ready to go off on his own getting a lot bigger. And that's the end of our story about Honeypot and Lightfoot, but there's a note from the author here, um, so I will read that. It says, Honeypot, Lightfoot, Old Man of the Mountains, Big Hairy One. 
For Native Americans and Native people all across Eurasia, to speak the name bear was to evoke its power. Instead, out of respect for the bears, they were given nicknames, grandfather of the hill, grandmother, strong one, and the one who owns the den. These and other nicknames were used by the Finns, Tungus, Laps, and Blackfoot Indians, among other tribal peoples across the Northern Hemisphere. The bears of this story are brown bears, also known as grizzly bears, in the interior of the northwestern part of North America. From Scandinavia clear across Siberia and into North America, they are both the same species, Ursus arctos, which means bear in Latin and Greek, respectively. So, in the U.S., in the northwest where we have grizzly bears, those are the same types of bears they're saying that live over in Scandinavia and Siberia, northern parts of Russia. Those are all the same kind of bear. For thousands of years, brown bears have evoked fear in humans for good reason. They can weigh up to almost one ton. The Kodiak bear, a brown bear of coastal Alaska, grows larger even than a polar bear. They run faster than the fastest human, and with a massive paw, smash the spine of a moose. Whoa. And they are very unpredictable. Yet a visitor to a national park in bear country is about 300 times more likely to be killed by a car than a bear. But fear is not the sole reason why native peoples have respected bears. Traditionally, they have felt kinship with bears, considering them our closest animal relatives. Indeed, one traditional name for bears used by the Haida is elder kinsmen. For the Haida and other Pacific Northwest cultures, bears are a powerful totem and are important family crests. To the Cree in central Canada, bears have been known as four-legged humans. Like humans, bears are intelligent and curious. They often stand on their hind legs, walk upright, and pick berries in the same manner as a person. Like humans, they are omnivores. What's an omnivore? That means they eat meat and plants. It says they can eat almost anything, preferring highly nutritious food they can get easily and in large quantity. Therefore, except for coastal brown bears with easy access to salmon, they are 80 to 90% vegetarian. Did you know that about bears? Same is true with our black bears in Minnesota. They mostly are eating um, berries and different nuts and grasses. Sometimes they do really like to eat insects, but bigger meat than that is not a big part of their diet. It's understandable why many tribes would not eat bear meat, believing it was like eating a person or a relative. The famous naturalist John Muir called bears our, our hairy brothers. They could as well be called our hairy sisters or mothers. Bears are good mothers. Cubs are not born knowing how to be bears. They must learn from their mothers. The males take no part in rearing cubs. Cubs nurse for one year, and a yearling would have little chance of surviving without its mother. But by age two or three, the young bear's mother will chase it away. By then, the cub will be ready. It will be big and strong and smart. Yet in spite of their great strength and intelligence, in the lower 48 states, where there are less than 900 left, Brown bears are listed as threatened by the Endangered Species Act. The last grizzly in the Golden Bear State of California was shot in 1922. There are perhaps 50 left in Norway, 300 to 500 in Finland and Sweden, 100 in Italy, and 150 in Spain, and only 20 or so survive in France. Thousands still roam Alaska, northwestern Canada, and what was once the Soviet Union. But even in these areas, brown bears are rapidly disappearing. Can we learn once again to share the land with bears? As native people once learned, grizzlies need space. Can't we afford to give space to Honeypaw and Lightfoot? Can we afford not to? And that's the end of our story of Honeypaw and Lightfoot. So there's a couple things I wanna do. First of all, the really exciting thing I talked about at the beginning is it is something called fat bear weed on explore.org. So like I said, bears need that big layer of healthy fat for them because that's how they're gonna survive winter. So they've put cameras out in a national park in Alaska where all summer long they've had cameras on these river and they've been watching the bear feed on salmon. So these are those coastal grizzlies that were talked about in the book. And they've watched them get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So these bears are huge now. And for one week at the end of September into October, which is right before these bears are gonna go hibernate, when they're gonna be their absolute biggest, they hold a competition called Fat Bear Week. 
So you can go online, you can see these bears, and you can vote for which bear you think got the biggest and fattest over the summer, which is a good thing if you're a bear, right? That means that you have a really good chance of surviving the winter. Um, so you can see their pictures, you can watch videos of them in the river. Sometimes they're doing really funny things when they're kind of swimming, or they might fall over the waterfalls when they're catching salmon, or maybe you might even see them fight with another bear. So there's lots of fun things to watch on there. And then you can put in your vote for who you want to win the Fat Bear Week contest. The other thing it mentioned in the author's note is that we're losing a lot of grizzly bears and their populations have declined. And part of that reason is because we kind of are afraid of bears and we don't want them anywhere near us. We don't want them in our space and they need space too. So I'll put in a link too for a resource where if you want to learn more about grizzly bears or what you can do to help grizzly bears and their habitat, um, it will have some suggestions for that. Thank you so much for joining in Storytime this week. I hope you get out and look at explore.org and check out those bear cams. They're super fun to watch. And we'll see you soon for another Storytime. Bye-bye.